It's pop quiz time. Just what you wanted when you came to church this morning, huh? A pop quiz. Well, let's see how well y'all do, how awake you are, how prepared you are. I'm going to say something, and I want you to respond with the proper phrase. Sound good? I'll say something, and you respond. You're going to know what to do, I promise. Make sure you do it loudly and proudly, though, okay? All right. Christ is risen. I like the hallelujah at the end. Good. Thank you. This is the day the Lord has made. Good. Christ has died. Christ is risen. The force be with you. Ha ha, I got you. I got you. Did you catch what I did? Good. It sounded like I said the Lord be with you, didn't it? Which you would normally respond with and also with you. But I changed it. I said the force be with you. A couple of weeks ago on May the 4th, Nerds around the world celebrated Star Wars, Star Wars Day. And the nerdiest of nerds, also called preachers, often turn this day into a day of Star Wars church-related church jokes centered around what I just did. Rather than saying the traditional statement of the Lord be with you, we nerds will say the force be with you. Or may the force, as in May the 4th, may the force be with you. To which other nerds will say, and also with you, or if they're Catholic, and with your spirit. And if you have a number of clergy friends on social media like I do, that's pretty much all you see on May 4th. Just tons and tons of awful church-related Star Wars puns. It is something. But this morning, as we talk about the Holy Spirit, I wonder how many of our fellow Christians, or even some of us here today in this room, think the Holy Spirit is something akin to the force from Star Wars. We often think of the Spirit as being impersonal and emotionless, that the Spirit is something that could be manipulated and wielded, that the Spirit is nothing more than a power-up like the mushrooms from Mario Kart or the spinach for Popeye. You get a dose of the Spirit and you become a super Christian or you become invincible and you can go out into the world and easily defeat the forces of evil. That's not the case though. Despite the sermons that I have heard on this very topic, and I've heard more than one, the Holy Spirit is nothing like the force in Star Wars. For starters, the Holy Spirit is God, a person of the Trinity. He's not emotionless or able to be manipulated. Instead, as God, the Spirit has a personality along with a will and desires. And rather than being used to just bring order or chaos to the universe, depending on how it's used, like the force, the Holy Spirit actually brings God's kingdom into reality. He brings life eternal, and he pours out grace. And while the Spirit is unbridled power, he is, after all, the very power and presence of God, he doesn't turn us into superhero Christians. The Spirit actually just turns us into Christians, where love fills every fiber of our being. I've told you all before that sometimes when we talk about God, it's easier to say what God is not. So if the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, is not like the force in Star Wars, then what is he like? What does he do? To answer those questions, we need to do a deep dive into Scripture, and we need to see that the Holy Spirit permeates every part of the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments. In fact, we believe the Spirit inspired the writers of Scripture to actually write it all down. Paul says in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed. And that last word is key. Paul didn't use that word on accident. Breathed. 
Throughout Scripture, the various writers of the library that is the Bible wrestled with the limits of human language to describe the Holy Spirit. They often talked about God's Spirit being His personal presence in the world, God's personal presence in the world. And to help us understand that, early Hebrew writers used a particular word for the Spirit. Ruach. Ruach. Ruach is the word for wind or breath of God. This word appears at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Ruach, the Spirit of God, was hovering over the waters. There in the first two verses of the Bible we see the Holy Spirit full of power and grace. Through the Spirit, the universe comes into existence. But the Spirit doesn't disappear after creation only to show up when Jesus is born. Not at all. The presence and power of God falls on certain people throughout the Old Testament. Later in Genesis, we see that the Spirit has come upon Joseph and has given him the ability to interpret dreams. This leads him into Pharaoh's court, where after Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams, Pharaoh says, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? See, this great pagan ruler, who did not believe in the Lord, still saw the truth. He saw the Spirit of God resting on Joseph. His power and presence is that undeniable, even to the pagans. Later, the Spirit comes to a man named Bezalel in Exodus 31. Bezalel had been chosen to design the tabernacle where God would dwell in the midst of his people Israel. By the Spirit, Bezalel was given the wisdom and the skill to take simple raw materials and build the dwelling place of God on earth. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. Later in Judges, we see the Spirit come upon various judges, those rulers of Israel for the time, on people like Gideon, who thanks to the Spirit's courage, was able to take on 100,000 soldiers with 300 Israelites. The Spirit later descends on King Saul, the first king of Israel, The Spirit anoints him and empowers him for this work, giving him a new heart of sorts. That is, until the Spirit leaves him and he falls into deep despair. Beyond the kings and rulers of Israel who were at times filled with the Spirit, the Old Testament prophets are consistently lifted up as people who have been empowered to speak for God to the people. And because they have been enabled by the Spirit to see the world as God sees it, this leads them to call Israel to repentance, warning them that they will be judged harshly for consistently violating the covenant. They see and know that the Spirit of God, the Ruach, has made the world and made it good. But they also see and know that we humans have given into evil and unleashed chaos on the world. We have a divided heart where we long for God, but still consistently choose evil. This is why the prophet Hosea says that we have within us a spirit of prostitution. Something within us, that divided heart, always pulls us away from what is good and what is right. We are persistently disobedient. But this sinful condition that we are living with is why prophets like Ezekiel and Isaiah say that God will put within us a new heart and a new spirit. 
Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I give your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. And what's more is the people of Israel long for this. They look back at Joseph and the judges and some of the kings and the prophets, and they want that more than anything. They plead with God to give them a new heart and a new spirit so that they can be filled and enabled to keep the covenant in its entirety. And you know, it's almost like God says, man, I thought you'd never ask. Because more generations pass and Something completely new and unexpected happens. God takes on flesh and walks among us. Jesus comes and the Spirit rests upon him. He even talks about this in Luke 4. He's quoting Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the long-awaited Messiah who will pour out his spirit and put that new heart in us that we have so longed for. We see his power through his healings in raising the dead and in all of his other many miracles. We also see it in his resurrection as the Spirit breathes life back into his body, just like that valley of the dry bones that Ezekiel saw. And in that resurrection, the promised new creation breaks out on earth. And as a part of that, Jesus breathes on his disciples before ascending into heaven and pouring out the Spirit on all people. This is Joel's vision that Peter quotes in Acts 2, finally realized. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. But this brings us to us. The story now comes to us. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on us now. And that's essential if we are going to be saved. Salvation is impossible apart from God intervening on our behalf. No striving, no works, no amount of religion or effort can save us sinners. Only God makes it possible. God didn't send Jesus just to teach us. He didn't fill creation with the Spirit just to inspire us. He's not up there hoping we'll figure out salvation and our sin like there's some sort of equations that we have to solve in math class. No, the grace and power of God through the Spirit has been at work in your life even before you knew Him. It is through the work of the Spirit that we are empowered to respond to God's love. And at the moment we say yes to Christ, the Spirit goes to work in us, in our hearts and in our lives, changing us in a permanent way. This is what Jesus was talking about with Nicodemus. You must be born from above, he says. You must be born again. It's quite literally Jesus' way of telling Nicodemus, you need to start over. You need a fresh start. You can't figure this out on your own, so let me take your divided heart and put a new clean heart within you. But let me be clear. This is not an instantaneous thing. Jesus does not give us a steroid shot in the arm and we're done. It is often a process, a winding road without any clear signs sometimes. More often than not, it is difficult. Where things are left behind so that new things can be picked up. Like those secret sins that you've dealt with your whole life. Those chains must be broken and laid aside so that your hands can be free to pick up your cross. 
and that's hard. But the good news is that in our faith, in our new status as disciples, as children of God, we have become temples of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks a lot about that in 1 Corinthians 6. The work of salvation is being accomplished within you by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. You are being transformed right here and right now as we speak. You are being remade in the likeness of Jesus and we are empowered to participate in this through acts of piety and acts of mercy through things like prayer and scripture reading and Holy Communion, as well as serving our neighbors in need. Through all of this, the Spirit is at work, chiseling away at our hearts of stone and putting the very heart of Christ within us. But here's the problem. For many of us, when we came to faith, we prayed a specific prayer, we made a decision, And we sort of committed to this whole Christian thing. But we really weren't sure about this whole spirit thing. I think that's where most Methodists are, honestly. And this was John Wesley's fear. I am not afraid, he said, that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist, either in Europe or America. But I am afraid, lest they should exist only as a dead sect having all the forms of religion without the power. If this is where you are, hear me. Jesus loves you. You are a Christian. But when it comes to the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, you are agnostic. So I want you to know what the Bible says about this. I want you to know that Romans 8 says the Spirit intercedes for us, that when we don't have the words to pray, the Spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. I want you to know that in John 16, Jesus teaches the Spirit, instructs us, teaches us, and admonishes us. I want you to know that in Galatians 5, we hear the Spirit bears fruit within us, fruit that is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The Spirit truly transforms us into the image of Christ. And I want you to know that in Acts and Romans, we learn the Spirit gives direction and guides us in accordance with the Father's will. But listen, if you are agnostic on the Spirit, the Spirit will remain unwilling in you too. God is not interested in forcing your hand. He's not a dictator He's not a puppet master, but he is interested in bringing freedom and abundant life. So you need to decide, are you ready and willing to receive it? I love the way that Pastor Carolyn Moore, she's a GMC pastor, puts it. She said, we have experienced the Holy Spirit dispensed through an eyedropper so long that we have no idea what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you and I want this church to know what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Beyond us as well, we need to see what the Spirit is doing in the world around us. And a huge part of this is realizing that we as Christians and we as the church are sometimes avenues for the Holy Spirit into the world. That's what Pentecost and Acts 2 are all about. The church was born that day And as the believers are filled with the very presence of God and the Holy Spirit, they are sent out with a calling to go into the world and to be witnesses of Christ. We are being sent out as living temples of God. You see, evangelism is so much more than just saying a little something about Jesus to that coworker who's having a hard day. That's important, don't get me wrong, but it's a whole lot more than that. Really, it's about being filled with the power and authority from on high to go into the world and to bring light to the dark places. And take it from me, because because I've seen it. When someone who has been awakened and changed by the Spirit walks into the room, you know it. Everyone, whether they're Christian or not, knows it. 
They are on fire and everyone can feel them burn. And that's the thing about the Holy Spirit. He's the very presence of God. So the Spirit can't help but change everything He touches. That's why our prayer team and prayer teams all over the Global Methodist Church are routinely, regularly, daily praying for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit and the renewal of the church. You know, I saw this last week, that mainline Protestants, of which we Methodists are a part, now account for just 9% of Americans. 9%. It was more than 50% in the 1950s. And I wonder if a big part of this is that we have lost touch with the Holy Spirit. Methodist evangelist E. Stanley Jones said, unless the Spirit fills, the human spirit fails. And we have failed for over 60 years. We have tried every church growth tactic out there, spending millions on consultants and books and get rich schemes, but in terms of salvation. We get, fill your church, just do these three simple steps. We've done everything from de-emphasizing our beliefs to just sometimes regurgitating Fox News and MSNBC talking points. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And all that's happened is more churches have closed and more people have walked away from the faith. So I encourage you, I implore you to join with our prayer team and our sisters and brothers across the GNC in praying for an awakening in the church, asking the Spirit to bring a second Pentecost, tearing open the heavens and coming down, filling us, refining us, and making us new. Ask for more. Plead for more. Don't get complacent. Be hungry for God. Beg God to send His Spirit upon you and upon His church. Because God will deliver. And everything is going to be changed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.